Welcome to um, the last of our uh, symposia of the uh, fall semester. Uh, you're, um, we're delighted to have you here for a, a very interesting set of uh, three talks on new directions in participatory democracy. Um, we'll be changing the order just a bit, beginning with uh, Michael Menzer of Brooklyn College, followed by Ken Esty also Brooklyn College, and then our Michigan State person just landed. His flight was delayed on account of fog, but he, we expect he'll be here in, uh, by, uh, within an hour or so at most, so he'll go third. Um, and he's um, a very interesting uh, philosopher from Michigan State who works on indigenous peoples, climate justice, and participatory democracy. So um, this session, as usual, will be followed by one of our famous receptions. Um, we're getting even more elaborate in our um, treats, so all kinds of healthy um, sort of salads and things in addition to our usual wine and cheese. So you're all welcome to join us afterwards in the Globalization Lounge in 50, 5109. We'll all be heading over there together. Um, so let me introduce um, perhaps all three speakers, one at a time, all three. Okay, so Mike Menzer is, um, teaches philosophy and environmental studies at Brooklyn College and also is at the Graduate Center in Earth and Environmental Science and Environmental Psychology. Um, and he's also a board member of the CUNY Institute for Sustainable Cities. He's the co-founder and president of the board of the Participatory Budgeting Project, which you've all heard about, I'm sure. Um, Participatory budgeting is a process in which part of a public budget is turned over to those who are most impacted by that budget. And over the last three years, uh, the project has worked with community organizations and elected officials uh, to bring PB, participatory budgeting, to four cities in the United States. And you're completing a book on participatory budgeting and on participatory democracy more generally, which will be coming out in the Temple University series on global ethics and politics, which I edit. I'm really fortunate to have his book as part of the series. Um, and um, he's interested in democratic theories and practices that focus on ecological and social justice in urban regions and food systems. Um, maybe I should just leave that as an introduction, but I know that, uh, as you probably know, um, Mike is very excited about uh, the possibilities that seem to be uh, promised of an expansion of participatory budgeting in our city um, under the new leadership of the mayor. So um, he would be glad to uh, give you more information about his, his project and hope that you'll support it. But at this point, you're going to do more of a uh, present academic scholarly presentation. So let me introduce Mike Menzer. We're delighted to have you. Thanks, Carol. <laughs> thanks, everybody. And thanks to Carol and the Center for uh, hosting us tonight, which is also the, it's the last event in your program for the fall. And it's the sort of pre-event for our Philosophy of the City conference. Uh, which is going to be all day tomorrow at Brooklyn College and all day Saturday at Brooklyn College. And I know some people, are, some of the panelists are already here, which is great because there was this whole deal of fog closing down three of the airports this morning for several hours. Um, and so uh, uh, that's why Kyle is late and others uh, are late as well. But Kyle will be here hopefully uh, within about 40 minutes. So I'm going to basically, I'm going to talk about a view of participatory democracy and then I'm going to bring it to bear on the present situation with redevelopment um, that New York City is under, uh, hoping to undergo uh, with respect to Hurricane Sandy and climate change. So my, the uh, sequence of my presentation is going to be first just sort of spelling out a vision of a particular demo uh, partic participatory democracy, particular view of it, contrasting it with some other views, and then I'm going to go through a lot of the nitty gritty with the situation with Sandy and the existing processes in the city um, that have promised some kinds of participation around spending the monies for redeveloping New York. Um, for those of you who follow such things, um, New York City is about to undergo the biggest, maybe one, of the, maybe one of the two biggest redevelopments or reconstructions of its physical infrastructure in its 400 year history. 
Uh, it's going to involve about $20 billion in the first phase of it. Um, and so this is an incredible moment in terms of what the city, uh, in terms of the visions that we have, being able to kind of have an impact on the kind of redevelopment. So this is part of what Carol was saying in terms of the kind of possibilities of the moment that we're in. So uh, there are two versions of this talk. One is 25 seconds long, and the other is about 20 minutes long. So the 25 second version is this. If you go to the NewYorkCity.gov site, and you say, I'm interested in climate change, and it takes you to this. It says, if you would like to give us feedback about rebuilding New York City and making it more resilient to future storms and climate change, please email us. So for those of you who think that participation can take place in a meaningful way via the email, there you go. Thanks for coming. Um, that's cool. Um, and for those of you who don't, uh, I'm going to offer a kind of different framework and look at some different mechanisms. Thankfully, there were some other mechanisms. Although, and this is odd because this wasn't up a couple months ago, but now it is up. And as was said, I didn't email this ad. You know, I should have emailed to see what happens. I, I tried some other things. Um, but we'll come back to some of the alternatives on this. So the view that uh, when, when I talk about participatory democracy, the kind of general view that what I mean by that is it's a view of politics which calls for the creation and proliferation of practices and institutions that enable individuals and groups to better determine the conditions in which they act and relate to others. So then you go to this quote uh, by David Held, very influential political theorist, and he says, an equal right to liberty and self-development can only be achieved in a participatory society. This is not a view he endorses, by the way. He's just characterizing the view. Uh, a society which fosters a sense of political efficacy, nurtures a concern for collective problems, and contributes to the formation of a knowledgeable citizenry capable of taking a sustained interest in the governing process. So this view that the idea that offering these mechanisms for participation enhances the agency of residents of the polity. So that's its virtue. Um, this can be contrasted to many other sort of conceptions of justice, which may focus on the fulfillment of some good, interest satisfaction, the protection of negative rights, uh, the uh, and, uh, mechanisms for enforcing human rights or access to basic goods, community identity or Republican views, um, or ones that focus on the fair distribution of income and assets and liberalism. You can imagine all those different things on the left or you know, some combination of them happening without any kind of effective means of participation. They could include it, but they don't mean it. And the PD, uh, participatory democratic view, which stresses the importance of human agency in, in the political arena, uh, the focus then becomes to, comes to bear upon deliberative decision making, Education, which contributes to the ability to do that kind of decision making. Uh, there's a kind of a quality amongst the people engaged in deliberation, and there's an efficacy to what they're doing. It's not just pointless, uh, going to nowhere type stuff. And then also, bro more broadly, there's an economic redistribu redistribution or reconstruction to promote three, which then enhances what? So if you're looking at this view, OK, where does this view happen in the history of philosophy? It doesn't happen that often. Um, before World War II, Rousseau was a frequent person cited that kind of advocates this level of participation or some sort of meaningful participation that's crucial in terms of the general will formation. Uh, Tocqueville is a more commonly cited scholar. And again, I'm, I'm being very philosophy-centric here, sort of intentionally, very uh, Western philosophy-centric here. Uh, John Stuart Mill is frequently cited because of his work on, on politics, especially in the work on politics. Kropotkin is someone who I think is unfairly not included and actually writes at length, and I'll talk, talk a little bit more about that later, in a very consistent, coherent way about participatory democracy. And then G.D.H. Cole is another figure largely not, not very influential in terms of the contemporary uh, American tradition, uh, but is nevertheless someone who's written extensively on it. The phrase participatory democracy, for those of you, uh, the etymologists in the house, um, Arnold Kaufman in an essay called Democracy and Human Nature coins it and sort of defines it in 1960. And he has a student in his class whose name is Tom Hayden. Um, some of you know the story. And Tom Hayden, uh, besides marrying Jane Fonda, did a few other things before that happened. Um, and he f was helped uh, to found an organization called Students for a Democratic Society, whose Port Huron statement is a kind of much more robust elucidation of the concept of participatory democracy that he found about, uh, that kind of Kaufman kind of got him thinking about. Um, Again, sort of just speaking to the literature and, and, and this nomenclature, Carol Pateman's book is really, the, is certainly the first and oftentimes 
nowadays still the most frequently cited work on participatory democracy as such in this tradition, that's 1970. Other key works, you got Mansbridge in 1980, Barber's in 84, The Strong Democracy, uh, Carol Gould's Rethinking Democracy in 88. And then it really does, and I know and, and some people have written about this, you, it kind of fades largely in the 90s, which is interesting. The globalization literature, there's a number of different sort of shifts that happen. Um, and then uh, there's Fran Francesca Poletta's work, who is writing as, as uh, doing work as a sociologist, um, but she's still someone who kind of gets it back on the table for philosophers and political theorists to kind of continue the thinking about. Uh, and then by the time you get to the 2000s, I, I, Boa Santos, who, you know, his work, I think, then you really start to see a, a very robust articulation of, again, of this view again, that deals with a lot of the philosophical issues, but it's coming from outside the U.S. And the Santos gets translated, and he writes in English as well. Uh, he's Portuguese, and he's in, spending a lot of time in Brazil. But then you really start to see it circulate and re-energize a lot of the, the literature around it. So the kind of view of participatory democracy um, that I developed um, in two essays, and then the book should be out by 2026, not because of you, because of me, I'm ho at the pace I'm working. See, the great thing that happens is that, you know, you write about the stuff, and then, you know, but it keeps happening. It's actually happening, so then you've got to kind of put stuff aside sometimes to, you know, because it's exciting, because you want to get involved with, but anyway, but it's going to be done. Um, and don't tell Carol. But uh, the, um, so the kind of view that I've kind of uh, put forward over the last several years is, um, got four tenets. And so there's democratic collective determination, uh, capacity development for individuals and groups, delivery of economic but also social and political benefits to the members and constituents, and then the construction, cultivation, proliferation, interconnection of movements and organizations with over overlapping normative frameworks. So, and this is why I say this, this idea of you're maximizing, uh, again, those one through three should seem, uh, should resonate with the earlier list that we had, which are very agency oriented and then also articulating the conditions necessary for the development of that agency. So the kind of nutshell definition that I give is a, because of changes within or outside of the polity and the aspirational nature of such norms, collective determination is perhaps best understood as the adaptive evolution of a dynamic regulating, enti uh, uh, evolution of a self-regulating entity seeking to maximize the agency, equality, and the good of its members over time. So it's a dynamic process, it's an imperfect process, it's only partially realized, but it should have this kind of expansionist in the good sense uh, driving it. Expansionist in terms of normative fulfillment and expansionist in terms of institutional reach. Um, now, in practice, this can take place, it's supposed to be able to take place anywhere. So it's not just governmental decision making in terms of policy making or administration and budget allocations, but it also could be in economic in terms of worker cooperatives, which we'll hear more about with Ken's presentation, public banks, community land trusts, or it could be social in terms of collective households or intentional communities, which actually resonates with the more communitarian picture that Kyle uh, will give. Um, so in sum, we shall broadly apply the term participatory democracy to those decision-making structures that adhere to basic democratic procedural norms, such as, again, equality and majority rule, yet tend to extend equality by some sort of grassroots decision-making of an authoritative nature. In other words, participatory, democratic, participatory democracy connotes decentralization of power for direct involvement of amateurs in authoritative decision-making. This is one of the other few early works from Cook and Morgan, the book, uh, an anthology called Participatory Democracy. And what, get, what happens there is this idea that you're violating the ruler-ruled distinction or the governor-governed distinction. And you're allowing the amateurs to engage in governance. And that kind of puts you back in dialogue with the social contract tradition uh, and what constitutes the notion of the people and those who govern them. Now, put that participatory democracy stuff in a part of your brain that you won't lose it. Um, and now we're going to dive into the Hurricane Sandy situation and look at the different mechanisms for participation for redevelopment after Hurricane Sandy and then kind of evaluate them from a participatory democratic perspective. So that's what we do. So uh, for New Yorkers uh, you, who lived through this, you, you know a lot about this. Uh, for somebody else who might not be as familiar, uh, 43 deaths, si that's in the city, in the five boroughs, not in the region. It's about 90 overall in the United States. Oh, actually, it was 108 in the United States. 6,500 patients evacuated from hospitals and nursing homes. Nearly 90,000 buildings in the inundation zone. 1.1 million New York City children unable to attend school for a week, mine too. Close to 2 million people without power, me too. 11 million travelers affected daily, yep. $19 billion in damage. 
So it's not just Hurricane Sandy, but the idea is that this was a kind of instantiation of the power of climate change in the geographical space known as New York City metropolitan region. So when we think about this region relative to the climate and relative to, uh, relative to water, it's a very, uh, I don't want to say frightening, but it's a concerning situation. And the first is New York City has 578 miles of coastline. Now this boggles the mind, but we're like 22 islands. You know there's like 22 islands uh, in New York? So 578 miles is like to Georgia. I checked. Like that's a long as the crow flies. 578 miles. So we have that much geographic space on the water. Well, sea level rose by a foot since 1900. Depending on who you believe, it's going to rise one to five feet more by 2100. The, the official IPCC will come out several months. Critical infrastructure in flood zones, energy, mass transit, communications, sewage treatment, substations, subways, and so on. You've got apartments, public housing, single family homes, nursing homes, lots of different kinds of residences, all in that critical, or so all in that zone A, what used to be called zone A, now it's called zone one. And then businesses, schools, hospitals, and governments. So what do you do with this stuff relative to this new dynamic? And one of the most curious phenomena is in the maritime and industrial areas uh, in Zone A. And so this is a map which shows um, the areas that will flood are the darkest reddish, uh, and then the orange and yellow are the, the next most likely, depending on the size of the storm. And in those areas, it uh, also overlaps with the major maritime and industrial areas in the city. So uh, Gowanus, um, Newton Creek, Newtown Creek, uh, Hunts Point, where all the food comes in. And in all those areas then are critical infrastructure from an economic perspective for the city. And in terms of we sometimes forget we're a port, where a lot of things come in. But also where a lot of toxins are stored, toxic waste. And then also it so happens that people of color are overrepresented both in these industries and in the residences that proximate to these zones. And the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, fantastic organization in New York, uh, its director is Eddie Batista, um, is really good at, actually, they did the map of this early on. This is from several years ago. And they were noting all this stuff before climate change, because from their environmental justice perspective, which again, Kyle also um, will touch on today and on Saturday. So, okay, so that's kind of the problematic. Who's focusing on redevelopment? Now, who actually has the power and the money? At the federal level, it's the housing and urban development. FEMA, what, FEMA's part of what agency? Everybody know? What? Homeland Security, right. Um, so Homeland Security, a lot of the funds come from them, technically speaking. They're generally administered by HUD, though. Uh, then there's a federal task force that was created by Obama. And then the U.S. Corps of Engineers, I never realized this, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, they're in charge of the coasts, like of all the U.S. I never knew that. Nobody ever told me that. Um, and so everything that we want to do with the coasts, in some sense, implicates and has to have the approval of the Corps to do it. At the state level, there's a director of resilience, Seth Diamond, uh, and then there's the state has this idea of the community reconstruction areas, and I'll tell you more about how they work later. And then at the city level, under Bloomberg, it was the New York City Economic Development Corporation that was in charge of putting together the plan to redevelop New York. And then these are all the other agencies that were uh, implicated in that process. The funds are mainly federal at this point. Um, 1.8 billion appropriated to the city last year, another 1.8 billion coming in March. Um, there's some state funds, a lot of the repairs come from state funds, like the MTA repairs and things like that. Some of it's federal, a lot of it's state. Then there's some city funds that come from the city, Bridgeport's another city that was, uh, that's put some money into it. Uh, foundations, the Rockefeller Foundation is the, by far and away the biggest foundation involved with the Sandy stuff right now and just baptized New York City, pun intended, uh, as one of the 100 cities that's gonna face climate change that's decided to help out. Um, and then private investment, banks, funds, conservancies. There's a new conservancy formed to fund this stuff. It's the Jamaica Bay Conservancy, which is head by, headed up by one of Bloomberg's partners at uh, Bloomberg LP. Uh, and pensions. Um, John Liu, before he leaves, helped to broker a deal to put $500 million of city pensions from the firefighters and clerical workers and police and teachers, and then got a billion dollars of private equity to put in a $1.5 billion fund that's going to go to related companies and Hudson companies to do redevelopment in Zone A. So these are the monies on the table. $1.5 billion, right? So that's almost as much as the federal appropriation. 
So that's the money. I told you we could do nitty gritty. So we could do this is nitty gritty. Okay, so the plan that was put forward by Bloomberg, by Seth Pinsky, was the, the, the head of the EDC. He's left. He's gone back to the banks. Um, and they put together this plan called the Special Initiative for Rebuilding and Resiliency, the SUR. It's 450 pages long. Anybody see it? Nobody saw it. Uh, it's very glossy. Bloomberg loved glossy. The, the, you know, the, there's always colored photos and stuff. Uh, and it's incredibly comprehensive. I mean, it lays out basically bulwarks and where the dunes should be raised to protect from the waves and new drainage systems and escape hatches and upgrades and marshes and all, not all five boroughs, about four boroughs. Um, gives uh, plans for, for infrastructure reconstruction, for economic development, for future emergency relief and planning, coordinating city agencies, and then it tabulated the cost of 19 billion. There's already 10 billion allocated, and as Bloomberg put it, there's about 5 billion laying around. This is how billionaires talk, right? Um, and, and then for the math majors, that means there's 4 billion unaccounted for, um, but there's the city pensions, so don't worry, Ken. Uh, the pensions are doing very well, by the way, in New York State. We're not in this situation like Illinois you know, or Detroit, correct. Um, now, it was interesting because when I, so I'm working with an organization called the Alliance for Just Rebuilding, and I didn't get to go meet Seth Pinsky. I was, I, they wisely did not let me come. But Seth, Seth, I like to call him Seth. Seth, you know, he, he, he likes to, to talk to people early in the morning for a few minutes. And so he had a meeting with Alliance for Just Rebuilding, and they said, look, there's a lot of stuff on economic development. You might not know this, but a lot of the areas in Zone 8 were already economically distressed. There was this thing called the financial crisis, and then there's also you know, patterns of uneven development in New York City for several hundred years. Um, and he said, well, look, we can't fix that. Right. And he actually said, you know, that's, that's not what this money's for. This money's for redevelopment and resilience and sustainability and so forth. Uh, but it's interesting when you kind of look at the damage from climate change and the storm, and then you compare it to the dynamics from the financial, the damage from the financial crisis. So water damage, power outages, no heat, no food, communication breakdown, transportation. And then you think of financial crisis, substandard housing conditions, lack of health care services, inequity in education, that's kind of a new one, uh, lack of job protections, benefits, fair wages, and lack of public space. And you can really see these two crises converge in a very unique institution, unfortunately, more and more unique institution, which is public housing in New York City. So in New York City, both these crises have been intense for several years, a couple decades. Um, New York City public, just to do the numbers, 334 developments, 178,000 units, 400,000 people in public housing in New York. 230,000 more received government assistance for their, um, for their apartments. And the water damage and mold in public housing before Sandy, before climate change, is unfortunately legendary and notorious. $13 million deficit this year, $78 million deficit next, next year. You see people run stories on how bad it is in public housing, and it really is, and the mayoral candidates all slept in public housing uh, over the summer. Well, some of the mayoral candidates, Loda didn't. Um, but de Blasio did, interesting. Um, and despite the negative perception, there's 227,000 individuals and families on the waiting list. So knowing full well a lot of the problems you can experience, there's still an estimated 400,000 more people on the waiting list. So. What's, so what are the funding options that might be able to address both crises? Well, CDBGs, CBGBs, no. I, it took me like a month to realize, I'm like, how is CBGBs going to solve this? I didn't really, you know, and they're like, no, and I'm like, you know. And it, I literally, I still to this day have a hard time saying it. Um, that's the director of resilience right there on the left, smoking. Um, so there are these things called community development block grants. And the, this program works to ensure decent, affordable housing to provide services to the most vulnerable in our communities and to create jobs for the expansion and retention of businesses. And a grantee must develop, I gotta read this because this is, I'll tell you where it's comes from, and follow a detailed plan that provides for and encourages citizen participation. This integral process is emphasizes participation by persons of low and moderate income, particularly residents of predominantly low and moderate income neighborhoods, slum or blighted areas, and areas in which the grantee proposals to use CDBG funds. The plan must provide citizens with the following reasonable and timely access to local meetings, an opportunity to review proposed activities and program performance, provide for timely written answers to written complaints and grievances, and how to identify the needs of non-English speaking residences. This is the federal money. This is the federal money. How much time I got? 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, 
So how do you spend it? Well, Bloomberg decided to take this money and put it into some contests. And I'm going to talk about that, and then I'm going to talk about the participatory angle. So the, the city got this federal money, which a lot of it's set aside for specifically what I just said. Um, now, Bloomberg set up these contests that were run by the EDC, and then there's also one that was run by Housing and Preservation Development, and there's the, the, the state and, the, and, the, um, and then there's a federal task force one. So a few details about how these processes. So on the right, the Bloomberg contest. Bloomberg decided he'd fund the best proposals to spur economic development in Sandy and Ap impacted in New York City. So anybody could submit a proposal, and you could get tens of millions of dollars. It's about $140 million in the pot. Um, the problem is, in order to submit a proposal, you had to include matching funds. So, you know, Ken, you could submit a proposal to have a $2 million redevelopment in, in Red Hook, say, and as long as you could come up with $1 million, the city would entertain your proposal. But if you didn't have the matching funds, that was the only criteria. Not that you'd be from New York or anything, but you have matching funds. Um, there was no deliberation at any stage, and they, these still haven't been announced who's won this. Supposedly, Bloomberg will announce it before. Another con uh, uh, contest happened with, uh, in the Rockaways, this Avern by the Sea. Uh, design teams work with locals to create proposals for developing of 80 acres of city-owned land. So there was some public conversation in the proposal development, and there were some community reps on the jury. And actually, they se selected an interesting plan, but the developer who the city awarded the, the 80 acres to, 80 acres, is not required to actually implement the plan. Um, and rebuild by design, and I'll skip this one, I can come back to this one. This is another one, this is run by the federal. Again, the problem is lack of kind of community participation at key phases, and then questions about implementation. So from a participatory democracy perspective, these don't look too participatory. Why? Well, it's not clear that the right people are participating. Uh, it's not clear that when the right people do participate, they have power. Um, and it's not clear that people are empowered by the process either. And those are all requirements from the principally democratic view, which is an agency-oriented view. So the Alliance for Just Rebuilding, which is this coalition of about 50 organizations now that's come together, they said, look, these are what our proposal are, pro uh, these are what our demands are. And we've been meeting with city agencies and, and meeting with groups and so on and, and have a bill before the city council and trying to get this perspective implemented. So first you want to do immediate relief, you want to take care of the mold and things like that. Then you want to make sure the investment is equitable. And then there's got to be the third one there. There's got to be some process where there's at least transparency and hopefully meaningful participation. And then also we want not just resilience, but we want sustainability in a kind of rich ecological and economic sense. So what they've said is that, look, there's different ways of thinking about participation. So there's the opportunity to modify approved projects. So one example might be, well, related in companies is going to develop you know, a, a new apartment complex. We want there to be higher requirements. It's local labor or it's union jobs. And we want affordable housing. So there's that kind of, map, that kind of model. And that's very familiar. The other would be to have a decisive role in the allocation process. So you have community members on the jury um, or work with the team members in, in different processes to actually develop proposals with the air experts there. Um, the other would be to have your own pot of money and set up your own participatory process with that pot of money. There's federal money. It's supposed to go to communities. Why not let the city council in conjunction with community leaders actually design the process? And then the fourth is to have your own model of economic development. Say, look, we got this model of participatory democracy or economic democracy. It involves worker co-ops. It involves public bank. It involves city-run uh, city business, perhaps. And this is our model. We want you to fund our model. So those are four different types of participation um, from the Alliance for Just Rebuilding perspective, which would be meaningfully participatory and democratic from their perspective. So participatory budgeting, as Carol was saying, is one example of a current process going on in New York that does this, where you have assemblies where there's participation in the beginning uh, by the community, and the community works with the experts to develop the proposals. Has anybody participated in participatory budgeting in New York City? OK, so some people got some direct. Um, there's real money. It's a million dollars per district uh, that's been in projects have come out of it. Uh, and you have community participation in the community votes at every stage. Um, this is just some of the numbers in there. I, I want to make sure we get to the end. And, and these are some of the projects. So it's its third year now. There's a number of different projects that have been uh, approved um, from technologies and public library to um, the charter school, uh, controversially. Um, uh, gar different kinds of garbage pickup, an ultrasound system for Metropolitan Hospital. This was all in East Harlem. Um, one of the other new ones in East Harlem is they have a bus that they bought that's a mobile kitchen, which the idea is that you want to teach kids how to eat and cook healthy. They don't want to come to your place all the time, so just drive the bus to them. Um, so, and there's been solar-powered greenhouses. That was another one. 
So this would be an example where there's um, a participatory process that's already in place in New York, and so why not model some of this Sandy redevelopment funds uh, and put it in that kind of process? So this is then you kind of bring it back to the larger perspective. How much time? What, what do I got? Two, three? I got a few more slides. T just tell me when to stop here. Um, so this is pr pretty much my conclusion. So and when we think about the challenge of climate change, you want to inform the public about climate change and Sandy effects, but you also want to deba debate the model of economic development. Right? The idea that the, the financial system or the economic development model that just tanked half the globe could now make us resilient is farcical. Right? So, and it's interesting how people who you would think would know better in a sense still fall back into that. Like, well, resilient means luxury condos with Dwayne Reed, Dwayne Reed on the bottom, and they're six feet higher. Now, right? So they'll, they'll be resilient. And it's like, well, look, Dwayne Reed, it has craft beer now. Dwayne, you can get craft beer in Dwayne Reed. That's great. But it's probably not going to be uh, an adequate you know, jobs development and economic democracy model. Um, so we got to figure out how to combine those conversations. And then again, implement a lot of these kinds of changes with uh, um, drawing upon existing successes, which again, we'll hear more about. Um, and then when we start to think about resilience, people don't just think about this actual physical infrastructure stuff that looks cool, but also what I would call social public partnerships and governance, which participatory ex budgeting is one example. Uh, and then also public economic partnerships. One of the most interesting in New York City, which is not well known, is that the Staten Island Fresh Kills Landfill now um, has a municipal-owned, union-run methane capture facility. And it makes that methane and converts that methane into liquid natural gas, puts it into the pipelines, and the city makes $13 million a year. And also means you don't have to put that fracked gas into that pipeline. This is such an amazing example which hits so many positives, and, and it's run by the city, and there's hardly any public knowledge of it. And in Bridgeport, you, we've seen this proposal for a Green Collar Institute, which connects the training for green jobs, but in a zero waste facility. Um, and so in my conclusion, I had to have it a sort of obscure theoretical component to my talk. So I call this the morphogenesis of oppositional post polybian multiplicities in honor of Yakovos, who came. Um, so Polybius, so we, when we come back, it's not, what I think I would really emphasize is people, so there's a lot of limitations to participatory democracy. What about scale? What about, it's not a one size, it's not supposed to be a one size model. And it kind of comes back to this notion of checks and balances. We, we have many different kinds of governmental operations to handle different kinds of questions and tasks and problems and challenges. You have the court system, you have the legislature, you have the executive. And I think that in different, they work differently at different scales, and I think that participatory democracy can, uh, can uh, operate in that way too. Different kinds of models at different scales, public banks at some scales, participatory budgeting at other scales, federal task force participatory planning at other scales, and so on. Um, and so that's just emphasizing that, you know, you can have these different models, um, and I'm going to end it there. So, thanks. I'll turn it over okay, so um, just to give you a sense of how I think we'll best be proceeding is that we'll um, hear uh, the next talk, and hopefully from Kyle, and then we'll, there'll be an opportunity for questions for all three speakers. Is that okay? So I'd like to introduce um, Ken Esty, um, who is Assistant Professor of Political Science at Brooklyn College and Coordinator of the Studies in Religion program. Uh, he's a member of the New York City branch of the Industrial Workers of the World, and he's on the Executive Committee of the Brooklyn College Chapter of the PSC, um, our union, the Professional Staff Congress. He's also a member of the Grassroots Economic Organizing Newsletter Collective, and he's working on a book about working class Protestant evangelicals who've been involved in labor struggles. Okay, um, so his, his talk today is Solidarity and Equality in the Democratic Workplace, the Case of Beyond Care. Ken, so glad you could join us. Thanks so much, and I'd like to uh, thank the uh, center for hosting us, and it's fun to be a hinge, a hinge panel because we're ending one set of uh, events and beginning uh, the events uh, for today, extending through the weekend, so thank you very much. And um, what I really enjoyed, I didn't know anything about, I mean, I know about your work, but I didn't know the particulars of the slides and such, and so for me, 
I'm looking at the first part of your presentation and then thinking, oh, how fun it would be to just hold out beyond care and say, okay, how does it match with the normative criteria that you laid out? And so I think then I leave you with that, is to say, okay, given the normative framework that uh, uh, Mike has laid out, how well does Beyond Care uh, meet um, that framework? So um, certainly uh, where we spend our uh, work life, you know, how we spend the best days, uh, the best hours of our day, you know, at work, I mean, that is the place where we feel um, participatory democracy or the lack thereof most acutely. And so in a place like Beyond Care, uh, a child care cooperative uh, based out of Sunset Park, um, here is an opportunity uh, like no other uh, to see whether in fact economic democracy works, you know, in fact whether uh, participatory democracy has any traction in those hours of our lives when we are working. And so um, what I'd like to do is um, present to you Beyond Care as a uh, case study. And, um, and I'd like to tell you about it, and so I shall. Um, Beyond Care, and I'm going to read to you straight from their literature, Beyond Care is a socially responsible cooperative business whose members provide child care services founded on the basis of democracy, equality, and justice. It provides living wage jobs in a safe and healthy working environment while uh, promoting personal growth and educational opportunities uh, for its members. And our core values, here they are, solidarity, respect, professionalism. There it is. Uh, Beyond Care's story begins with the Center for Family Life in Sunset Park. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It was founded in uh, 1978, and they've been working in the Sunset Park community with um, a variety of programs. And one of those programs included um, employment, finding employment opportunities. And uh, the older model was to find employment opportunities on a one-person, one-employment site basis. And uh, they were finding that... Um, over time, the kinds of jobs that they were training uh, clients to take, sure, it's great to train them, but the jobs that they had to assume afterwards were just not at all the kinds of places anybody would want to work. And so they had to think through, like, well, is there a better way? And um, indeed, the better way was not to go with single people, single employment sites, but to develop whole platforms uh, those whole platforms for employment, indeed, would be the cooperatives. Um, and so Sunset Park, I mean, uh, Center for Family Life in Sunset Park has been, now is starting to see itself increasingly um, as, of the many things that it does, as a cooperative uh, incubator. And they have um, come up with some pretty interesting uh, titles. I mean, Beyond Care, sure, in uh, 2008, but um, there's another one called um, uh, Si Se Puede that uh, started up in, um, let's see, in 19, uh, 2006. Uh, another one called uh, Golden Steps for Elder Care in 2011. Uh, a soccer uh, cooperative among the kids in 2012 called Kicking It. And then my favorite uh, name uh, so far, well, I do like the Emigre Gourmet. That's another cooperative that they've incubated. Uh, for uh, uh, cooking and such. But uh, my favorite one, and this is the latest, and you're among the first to hear about it, it's called uh, Trusty Amigos. Uh, and this, they just, uh, the beginning of November, they just started uh, taking care of, of, of what? Well, it's a pet care and dog walking cooperative, Trusty Amigos. And so, um, yeah, that's, it's exciting. So that's, uh, so they're doing well. I mean, there was another uh, cooperative that they started called uh, Color Me. Uh, that one did not make it. It was launched in the summer of 2010 and they were doing interior painting and such, but the members decided, no, uh, we just don't have the business. We just don't have the resources. It's not working, we will disband. Not every one of these work out, uh, certainly not. Um, but I think that uh, Center for Family Life has done a, they have a good track record. And uh, I think as I explained the uh, Beyond Care Cooperative, you'll get a sense of how that track record uh, works. 
So um, the first stage of Beyond Care began with an open house that the uh, Center for Family Life hosted in, uh, let's see, this would be June 19, 2008. And the applicants um, underwent a vigorous uh, orientation training that lasted until the end of uh, July of 2008. And Jackie Amaskita, the first president of the cooperative, she described that first meeting in this way, and these are her words. We were strangers. We were just 26 women meeting in a room that didn't know each other, knew we wanted to start a business. We had that in common. That was it. So it was very interesting in the beginning because we had name tags, because we didn't know each other's names. We had uh, name games every day. Every time we had a meeting, we had an icebreaker, you know, how to get to know each other kind of thing. And that's how we built our relationships and established ourselves. I mean, we're starting from the very beginning here. Their cooperative curriculum um, is a multi-dimensional training in all phases of childcare and the cooperative structure necessary to implement this work. And the focus is holistic and it emphasizes what is best for the children and really what's optimum for the child care providers too. Um, otherwise, and this is a key point, child care workers are expected to be at peak job performance, but with poverty wages, inadequate support, and job insecurity. I mean, this is the great irony of child care is that the very workers who are responsible for our children collectively, they are not themselves being taken care of. I mean, that is the, the great irony. Beyond Care is trying to solve that irony. Um, now, one of the uh, key issues here, and I um, don't have it with me right now, I was going to hold up my little uh, magnet, you know, uh, refrigerator magnet, Beyond Care, and I see it every morning, is that uh, for them it's about care but is beyond care. That is, we are, as they would say, putting 110% into this. Uh, we're talking about a, a very rigorous uh, training. In fact, um, here, you can't read it, but it's, this is, you can see the list, however. This is the uh, cooperative curriculum. Real quick, uh, CPR training with the um, uh, fire department in New York, child development classes by the Sunset Park Head Start teachers, uh, workshops on music, dance, food, uh, safety in the home, labor laws on domestic work, rules and regs of a cooperative business, uh, marketing workshops with Vidal uh, Partnership, um, challenge infant development workshop, a nanny course, child abuse um, awareness, uh, parenting journey through the Center for Family Life, ESL and the workforce. I mean, all of these components are part of the training process in order to become fully a member of the cooperative. You don't just sign up and then hit a home. I mean, you go through a very rigorous training, so you know if you're signing up someone with uh, Beyond Care, they've had a rigorous amount of training. Now, the issue um, in, uh, with child care here is that um, for others who are not involved in Beyond Care, uh, other kinds of models is that you would go to an agency and the agency would, um, and you're grateful, ah, I found an agency, ah, the agency has lots of homes that I could, you know, uh, be a candidate and see if I could get a job. However, what does the agency do? When you get paid, uh, and you're paid by the agency, um, perhaps, what does the agency do but takes a cut? And so, you know, your, standard, your wage standard is going to be that much less if uh, the agency has taken a cut. So this is the whole point with the child care cooperative is that there is no agency that's taking a cut. Um, but we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, the issue is this. Um, the, when you're, the, and also in these other kinds of agencies, or if you're on your own, do you have a workplace contract is there any kind of understanding um, outside of a verbal one with the parents with whom you're uh, negotiating? Maybe not. Um, the, uh, Priscilla Gonzalez, who was a director of the Domestic Workers Union, uh, but then an organizer with the DWU back in 2008, she visited with Beyond Care and she wanted to provide an update of what was going on in the world of child care. And as Amaskita noted, this is Jackie Amaskita, the first president or the first, yeah, the first president of uh, Beyond Care. She said, at this point, we were very naive. 
we did not know what was going on, and we sit there. And she gives us this 45-minute presentation where she tells us that we don't have the right to overtime, no right to sick time, no paid this, no paid that, and we're like, oh my God, wow, we have no rights under New York State labor laws. It was very shocking to us. What are we going to do? Now, this was in 2008. In November 29, 2010, New York State became the first state to uh, pass a Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights, but this is two years before then. Well, the women collectively decided in 2008 that they would use the template contract uh, provided by the DWU, the Domestic Workers United, and this is a 29-point template, and it includes work responsibilities, featuring a, a, a list of the jobs that we will do, uh, featuring a list of the jobs we're not going to do. Um, the pay rate is clearly stated. Uh, the beginning of the day, the end of the day, all of the expectations, even this, listen to this one here, a penalty for a late payment of wages. Imagine this, uh, child care workers um, getting a late payment on wages uh, if wages aren't forthcoming. Details on vacation, holidays, sick time, provisions for breaks, disclosure on surveillance, uh, notice for termination in, are in, included, all of these things. Signatures from the members of the cooperatives and the client are placed on the contract in front of a witness. Rather than putting oneself at risk to be fired when requesting such agreements after commencing work for a client, right? How difficult it is, you're working, and then all of a sudden, two months later, you say, ah, I would like a contract. Parents aren't going to take well to that. Uh, Beyond Care with Domestic Workers United said, no, let's get these contracts done at, before we even begin, uh, so that there's no risk of firing um, once you're in the middle of a, an employment situation. So uh, these were great, um, a great beginning. It was part of the training, and it's what, in fact, uh, beyond care, child care workers do, is they have this contract at the beginning. Um, the next stage for uh, beyond care, um, you know, in terms of their formation, commenced with building the infrastructure of the cooperative. No small task to do that. The arduous work of establishing, establishing what they wanted to gain from the cooperative, its mission and goal, the name and the logo, advertisement and promotion, and the contract um, all had to be completed before they could accept any child care uh, assignments. They had two-hour meetings once or twice a week during the months of August and September of 2008. They were necessary because members of the cooperative were not ready, you know, yet, uh, not only conceptually, and they had to ramp themselves up, uh, but they were also not ready because there was no money, you know, yet. And so they had to do some fundraising and to get seed money to pay for their startup costs. And so they performed service hours in the form of child care for members of other cooperatives. However, in October 2008, Beyond Care began accepting their first clients when, just as the national economy was staring into the abyss, the timing was exquisite. As one economy faced near collapse, this group of creative, hardworking cooperators, they were building a new economy for themselves. Power at the worksite must be matched by power within the cooperative structure itself. The members continue to meet regularly on a biweekly basis. Unless a member already has a child care commitment, everyone is expected to participate. Um, the leadership committee, Beyond Care has a leadership committee. Uh, they have a president, they have a vice president, they have two secretaries, and they have two treasurers. That's the leadership committee. They serve for a one-year term. They can be re-elected once. They also have two publicity directors and two members in charge of education and training, and they serve a, a six-month term. Uh, publicity directors lead publicity committee. Education and training leaders coordinate the work of the training committee. Um, and each uh, member of the cooperative has to uh, donate or give three hours um, over the course of a month in advertising and promoting the uh, cooperative. 
and at one point they can age out of that responsibility. But when you come into the Beyond Care Cooperative, you have to be uh, attentive to promoting Beyond Care. Um, no free ride there. Um, uh, basically, in response to a question about the meaning of the term democracy, equality, and justice, uh, Jackie Amaskita, the former president, responded that democracy means one vote, one member. All decisions are based on a voting process based mostly on a consensus model. Equality and justice refer to parity with other workers in other industries on fair wages and power on the job. Now, uh, Beyond Care is an app name for the cooperative, and um, I'd mentioned this earlier. I, I think it's a great name, Beyond Care, because of all of the training that they have to undergo in order to be ready to get started. Uh, Beyond Care has gleaned from other models of immigrant business and identified, um, and they have identified three major objectives for the members of the cooperative. And these are the three major objectives. Obviously, increased income. Secondly, the development of internal leadership. And three, providing mutual support. Um, increased income and the development of a living wage is building block number one. Uh, the development of internal leadership is inherent to the whole idea of a cooperative because without internal leadership, the cooperative is no engine to propel it into the future when the original leaders move on. You have to share the knowledge. You have to share the uh, capacity to lead or you need to share the uh, occasion uh, to lead. Decisions, again, are made on a horizontal basis within the discussions that occur in the meetings. Everyone is equal in the decision-making process. Mutual support is accomplished by the ongoing solidarity that members offer to each other and social and business related ventures alike. Um, and I should emphasize that the leadership committee does not actually make decisions for the cooperative, but only guides the group uh, during its one year term. Now, payment uh, received by the members um, is not uh, thrown into a common pool, however. Uh, the, each member of Beyond Care negotiates directly with uh, the parents. And that uh, negotiation then results in payment that they themselves uh, will then accept. They don't give it to somehow the Beyond Care structure and then it, no, they, they get it directly. Um, now rates charged by the members fall within preset pay ranges of the whole cooperative. So the whole cooperative has decided, okay, these are the parameters. This is as low as we go. This is, well, I guess as high as we go, or here's our range. But they can't somehow undercut each other. There is a bottom floor here. And so they have to respect that. Um, the stated rate structure is vital because it relieves the individual cooperative member from the difficult and unpleasant negotiations that can be part of the initiation process with a parent. Members have authority because they are backed up by their cooperative to hold firm to that wage. This uh, tilts and somewhat evens out the playing field, one that is usually skewed towards the employer, who often have an advantage in the English language because many of the members of Beyond Care, uh, English is not their first language, maybe not even their second language. Uh, Beyond Care meets these key challenges by prioritizing uh, continuing education in English um, and explicit attention to rate structure uh, counters the tendency toward mission creep. We've all, we all know that in our own job, right? Mission creep, job creep. Ah, I had three things to do, now I have five, and then next week you have six. Uh, it happens in childcare, absolutely. Um, sometimes uh, more children will be added uh, insofar as maybe two families want to get together and share a child care worker. No, no, this is not going to happen with Beyond Care. Um, so um, they make sure of this. Uh, now, the, the other issue here is that, um, you know, who's sort of minding the store, as it were, or who's minding the cooperative? Well. Right now, uh, client calls are received through a voice message system that Beyond Care uh, is working with at the Center for Family Life. The members of the cooperative decide based on schedules and skills and availability which members should interview for the position. Um, now, Beyond Care is not an agency, as I've emphasized earlier, 
but it's legally a non-for-profit cooperative corporation using a referring marketing model. Um, and let me repeat that. This is uh, Vanessa Brandsburg, who is, I believe, the lead cooperative coordinator and developer at uh, the Center for Family Life. And she uh, wanted me to emphasize, you know, when I was working on this earlier, that it's a non-for-profit cooperative corporation using a referring marketing model. Um, I want to call it a worker cooperative. And, um, you know, because... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Um, because of the principles that are implemented by the bylaws, it's a worker cooperative because the values of the members, the methods of the decision making, and the control that each person has in the cooperative. Um, you know, but at the same time, the members of Beyond Care work independently with their clients, but they may be regarded by their clients either as independent contractors or as employees. It's really, really interesting for me because they, the parents don't really know. I mean, they don't really have to know. It's not necessarily relevant. They might be surprised with the confidence with which a Beyond Care member will present herself. I, I believe it's, uh, it is all woman. But um, nonetheless, you know, the parents say, well, this is just you know, my child care worker, uh, she's an employee of mine. Well, yeah, but she's also a member of a cooperative and, and in a very strong position, I would argue. Uh, I call it a seesaw of power and perception. Uh, a parent may or may not have particular regard for his or her child care worker. Uh, let's hope that uh, the parents do. Um, although one could argue that in Park Slope, not to pick on a neighborhood, 60% of the parents were viewed as out of compliance with the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights a year ago. Uh, there was a rally in Park Slope in which um, Beyond Care and others, D Domestic Workers United, uh, held in Park Slope to say, hey, everybody, uh, maybe we should be paying attention to uh, the Domestic Workers' Bill of Rights here, which not is, it's not just the DWU Bill of Rights, but it's also law as of uh, November 2010. Nonetheless, the members of Beyond Care derive vocational identity and status from sources outside of the immediate workplace through their contracts. Um, they have business cards that feature the designation worker-owner and the solidarity that they have with each other. In other worker cooperatives, worker owners labor side by side to manufacture products or to provide services. Beyond care cooperatives do not own their workplaces, but as Amaskita put it, Jackie Amaskita, former president, she said, quote, I own the ability to make my own decisions when it comes to working with children and families and giving myself the flexibility as a child care provider to offer a good service and be paid for it justly with benefits such as a contract that will provide for me sick days and uh, holidays and vacation. Um, Beyond Care has opened up its uh, membership uh, about three times. Uh, they've had open houses in uh, October 2009, April 2011, and October 2012. Uh, they have 34 members now. Um, there has been some rotation, the original 19, uh, 17 of the original 19 from way back in 2008 are still there, but um, there's, there has been some turnover. October 2012, there were 100 applicants, fascinating. Um, 12 were accepted, highly selective. Um, they're working now with uh, 34. Uh, again, they have to go through that two-month um, apprenticeship right here. And so, um, you know, as Amos Kita said, you know, the co-op was very selective, and they wanted to make sure that the woman that they were bringing into our family, you know, they, they consider themselves a family, are the right kind of woman that are going to continue the business and keep up the same quality and the same goals and the same mission that we all have. Um, it was a scary process, uh, she said, but now the cooperative includes one member for whom English is her first language a big change given the original makeup of the cooperative. An energizing feature of Beyond Care is the focus on professionalism. In response to a question around perceptions of the term nanny, 
Amoskita emphasized that, quote, a child care worker can also be a daycare worker, and the nanny is not a child a daycare worker. Uh, more to the point, I think, here. So a child care provider is anyone that takes care of children. So I like to say that we're child care providers because we take care of children. We help them grow personally. I don't care for the word nanny. Uh, the Park Slope uh, group calls itself the uh, Park Slope Parents Nanny Compensation Survey 2013, but whatever. I'm from Kensington. There's a little bit of a rivalry there, you know. But um, yeah, although Kensington is uh, becoming a mini Park Slope in, in many ways. But um, is there anyone from Brooklyn here? Am I? Uh, yeah, it's. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, maybe I better be careful what I say, but um, nonetheless, I'm from Kensington. What, what, are, what, are, what can I say about that? All right, so here's the deal. Personally, I don't care for the word nanny, uh, Jackie Amoskita says. I've never cared for it. I'm not taking anything away from it. I just like the idea that I'm a professional and that I offer services that give me that title of child care provider. I'm providing a service for your family to take care of your children to help them grow to give them whatever it is that they need, whatever it is that that family needs to help them to do what they need to do. And in turn, I am receiving payment so that I can help my family survive and grow. Well, there you go. You know, I like Jackie. She's great. Here it is. In closing, the immediate issue is not whether cooperatives can rise up and challenge capitalism in an economic show of force. That's not the point. I think the point is whether it will ever be possible for ever increasing numbers of people over time to have the experience of democratic forms of economic decision making in their place of work. Cooperatives feature this possibility inherently within their very structure. If there is to be an economic democracy in the future, people will have to learn how to do it but the hierarchical class relations that are central to capitalism and the constitutive feature of daily work life cannot be unlearned abstractly. The experience of learning to create and share power is historical and it is embodied. Cooperatives are places where this can occur. The emphasis on expertise and the development of one's skills just might be what one member met at a, meant at a conference in January 2010 where I learned about Beyond Care when she said that you gotta pave the road for your own self. As a member, excuse me, as a number of other members asserted at the same gathering, quote, we are all human beings wherever we are from. Core line. We are all human beings wherever we are from. In a time when the bottom line is paramount, Beyond Care has created a top of the line community of workers ready to show a new world of work being birthed from the shell of the old. Beyond Care. Uh, we're still hoping our third speaker will make it in, in time to uh, give, he's very, very interesting, and, but he's uh, had to wait 45 minutes for a cab at LaGuardia, and now he's in one, trying to make his way here, so we'll see, it will depend on circumstances. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to proceed to the uh, question and discussion uh, session, it's a, a part of our, um, of our uh, panel. And um, please indicate to whom your question is addressed. There's a lot to discuss. I really think that these new directions in participatory democracy are of the utmost importance as we move ahead with alternatives and alternative ways of thinking uh, in the present. Yes. Please give your name. I should also uh, warn or inform everyone more, more to the point that we are videotaping all of our sessions. Uh, this has the great advantage that you can access them online and they're accessed around the world. Um, but uh, keep in mind that, um, you know, whatever, you might be watched <laughs> in what you say. Okay, so please, please indicate who you uh, identify yourself. Martin Ribbon from Columbia. Um, uh, Michael, this is for you. I'm wondering if you, um, given the 
fiscal constraints that de Blasio is going to face, do you see any problems in terms of some of the programs that he may want to institute, which will be different from Bloomberg, um, as being an impediment or hopefully not, given what he may have to contend with from Wall Street? Uh, I think that one of the things that the New York metropolitan region does not lack is capital. Um, you know, when you can go to certain parts of the globe that lack money, like money left Iceland, and Iceland actually did some very interesting things after money left, uh, and there are certain regions which, in a sense, capital has pulled out. Capital, I mean large investment funds just in particular, are in no way departing from this region. They are here. It's the question is who has access to which? So there's certainly no lack of money to do anything in New York, as the proposal for the South Street Seaport on the east side indicated. Uh, it's a question of how you tap it, or reclaim it, or reappropriate it, or expropriate it, or tax it, or whatever your verb of choice is. So that's the least of his problems. That's sort of a, uh, a fake problem, in a sense, which is very different from Detroit, for example. Um, yeah. So I think that's one of the great things when you start to introduce a lot of the participatory, you know, just to kind of come back to the participatory budgeting example, is people really start to look at budgets and monies and where they come from. And participatory budgeting is sort of about very small amounts of money. It's like 0.01% of the capital budget. Um, and participatory budgeting, actually, the money for capital projects in New York doesn't come from taxes. It comes from bonds. So right there, oh, well, you know, it, it makes you realize, again, in this region, we have all kinds of Ken, um, you mentioned other cooperatives uh, provided uh, seed money for the uh, Sunset Park Beyond Care. Who, who were the, what were the, which were these other cooperatives? Right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not clear exactly on that point, but I but I should say too that, um, and I didn't mention it, is that the members of Beyond Care pay uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of fifty dollars a month. Uh, as a form of a dues, and that money, yes, um, that money goes towards um, Center for Family Life to help pay for the infrastructure necessary to support the ongoing operation of Beyond Care. In fact, um, there's a office uh, coordinator who uh, spends half of her time supporting Beyond Care. However, the Beyond Care cooperators are only able to support her salary about around 30%. So there's a gap between what uh, the actual value of her services versus what Beyond Care cooperators are able to, uh, to do. And so at this point, technically, it's not a sustainable model but they're looking for ways to up that contribution gradually over time so that it does meet uh, what um, that person actually costs uh, the Center for Family Life. Also, there are cooperative uh, developers at the Center for Family Life who provide consultation hours and other kinds of support. And they're working very carefully to track that work to make sure that the on-care is not being uh, subsidized uh, invisibly because if you're going to have successful worker cooperatives down the road you can't subsidize them forever so when those women who left did they stay in that field or did they move up? I'm not sure I haven't How they move up? That, that's a good question I'd like to I don't know the answer to that uh, where they went question from the activists Questions for um, <coughs> for Mike. Um, since you is it Polybius? No, it's not Polybius. Thank you for the Polybius stuff. Um, um, since you had to go quickly through the the end of your talk, um, yeah. As as an aside, that your response to the last question made me remember a graffito that was popular in Athens in Greece uh, as the kind of crisis took hold there and things were increasingly fall apart. Which is which is the money exists and yes. spray painted all around Absolutely. and different, you know, that got increasingly popular. But um, since we had to go quickly through this, the question was, is there some participatory budget moment that's being implemented specifically with respect to Sandy? And if not, could you give, me, give us a description of a participatory 
budget activity like in a little more detail than like how it came to be and what what's involved in it. Um, yeah, just a little more than you had time to do. Okay, yeah. Sorry, I, I apologize for yeah going but too quickly through that. Um, well, first, in terms of participatory budgeting, just the overall, and I could bring up the slides again or not, um, but basically, the, just to do a little bit better detail, um, it, it happens, it's not a, a one-day event. It happens over several months. Um, it started off in Puerto Alegre in Brazil about 20-some years ago now. It spread to about 2,000 cities across the globe. Um, it's in four U.S. cities now. It, uh, one in Boston just started. It's also in Vallejo, California which was one of the first cities to go bankrupt during the fiscal crisis in 2008. And it's in Chicago, and it's in New York. Um, and the process is over several months. Uh, it begins with members of the community in a specific jurisdiction uh, talking about the needs of their community and then learning about the process. And then the members help shape the process, uh, which then goes about allocating the funds. So. They talk about different needs, different ideas for meeting those needs in their neighborhood, parks, school, you know, particular kinds of improvements for particular kinds of spaces and institutions. Um, again, it could be with a hospital or a library or security, traffic cameras, things like that. And then the key phase is various people from the neighborhood then step up to see those initial ideas through to make them full-fledged proposals that are vetted by city agencies for technical criteria and fiscal uh, financial criteria so that they're feasible you can do it you can put this particular kind of improvement in that park maybe it's not infrastructure wise set up for that or if you want a particular kind of um, drainage improvement here maybe it can't happen for some kind of reason so these kinds of nitty-gritty infrastructure things and then the pro proposal itself it's got to be it's got to cost at least thirty five thousand dollars because the city doesn't want to hear a lot of proposals for like 20 bucks to do this and that um, whenever I heard the 35000 I always became extremely excited. Like, wow, it has to cost at least 35000 But then you realize how much things cost. Like to plant a tree is thirty-five. You know, I mean, literally. Um, so actually, to plant a tree is a lot more than that. Um, so, well, at, at a city street, yeah, if it's a tree of a particular age uh, that is, you know, it's a lemon plant of a particular size and so on, you can quickly go into the tens of thousands of dollars. Tree guard, you know those iron tree guards around the base of a tree that pretend to keep dogs away from it? <laughs> They're five grand. Yeah. So, well, yeah, yeah, for, so for, for, for a block, for a block, to put those in on, say, 12 trees for... for Mafia control. Well, but, well, I, you know, it depends on your view of unions, right? Um, I mean, these are union jobs, you know, the, but the overhead costs in New York City, I mean, it's kind of like you can't have it both ways, right? You want to be paid, people to be paid well. Um, but anyway, you learn about budgetary costs and some of it. So um, anyway, so that's a very interesting phase where delegate, they're called the delegates, and they work with the city agencies over the course of several weeks to develop the proposals. And then the proposals that make it through that process are put on a ballot. And the people in the district, in these city council districts, vote on which ones to fund. Uh, and they generally, uh, you get five votes, you can choose five. Is it still five? Do you know, Jeremy? Uh, yeah, uh, you have, yes, it it's still five, five, right? You get five votes. And then the ones, and then there's a, about a million dollars in the pot, and you, you fund as many as there's for the money. Um, and um, to vote, you just need to be a resident of the district. You don't have to be a citizen, you don't have to be, a, uh, you don't have to be legal. Um, you just have to prove residency, which means you have a library card, um, and uh, or mail that came to you that says your name, um, and you got to be 16. Uh, that's the voting age. So um, that's the process. So we're tr we we do not have anything like that for Sandy funds at this time. Um, there are there's a process that we're trying we're trying to make basically there's a lot of attempts to make existing processes more participatory at this st at this stage. Um, which again either means participation by community in the proposal development or on the juries. Uh, it's very inadequate. Our best chance it looks like right now is for this federal task force funds because there's another billion. I mean, this is all billions. You know, we're participatory budget in New York is one million. This is all like a billion. Um, the little pots are 140 million, things like that. So, but again, because you're talking about things that cost a tremendous amount of money, uh, bulwarks, um, floodgates. Uh, so, um, so uh, we're basically in with the city has. I mean, this is again, there's a lot of nitty gritty here, but um, just you know. So, Bloomberg had enormous discretionary power to do whatever the hell he wanted with that 
CBGBs, as I like to call it, money. Um, and he just put 140 million. He could have made that a participatory budget process. I mean, he decided to make it a contest because he loves the Ryan Seacrest kind of model. Um, I prefer the voice personally because uh, then you develop the proposals, you know. Um, but um, but that's sort of the model he went. But the city, uh, the mayor, let's put it that way, the mayor has a lot of discretionary authority. So that's what we're looking at. And De Blasio has endorsed participatory budgeting. He said that he put matching funds in. Um, for existing, which would really get a lot more city council members involved. So we would, we're going to have 21, it looks like, next year. We went from four to eight to nine, um, and we're likely to have 21, 21 next is, year. Tell what? City council members, yeah, doing participatory budget. But that's all chunk change money. That's all a million bucks. If you go city council wide, then you start to get the tens of millions, and then if you go to the mayoral, you get the mayoral discretionary funds, then you're really, especially with the Sandy money, have a lot. But again, the other reason that I put that long sentence quote from the uh, HUD, it's Housing Urban Development, about the CDBG money, is that money is supposed to go to low and middle income community development. You know, it's not like it's just for anything and you know, all the developers fight it. And, and Bloomberg, and, you know, they get waivers for that stuff. And so, again, a Dwayne Reed looks like community development. You know? um, and that's just like, you know, we can win that fight. You know, we can argue that it, there's lots of good grounds, legal grounds and legislative grounds to, to get possible those money. Just to follow up, how would you organize it if it were citywide, or how would you try to get that from the ground up thing if, if, there were, if it did make it to the level of yeah. more than a city council, right. whether, whether with regard to Sandy or even more generally? Okay, so um, there have been requests for such proposals by certain mayoral peoples. Um, and in many other cities across the globe, it's done at the city level. So in New York City, some ideas being bandied about, it would be by sector. So for example, there's lots of interest in the food system in New York City. So you could imagine a participatory budget with several tens of millions in discretionary funds from the city for proposals for particular places that lack access to certain kinds of healthy food. So that could be anything from community gardens to uh, community-based infrastructure that would support gardening or uh, farmers markets. Um, for example, there's a need for storage facilities to make farmers markets more um, available to do things year-round. Um, there also could be job incubator uh, services um, for supermarkets or for job training in the food industry that help to incubate food co-ops. I mean, one of the things that I would politely disagree with Ken about is that there are plenty of businesses that are subsidized for very long periods of time, right? The idea, you know, I don't know you know this, right? Sure. But in New York City, there's all kinds of organizations dedicated to the subsidy, the subsidizing of very exploitive low road enterprises. And they get small business loans, and they get federal loans, and they get this kind of assistance from the New York City Economic Development Corporation. And again, we've been looking at all these funds, so what we're trying to do is connect some of these funds, especially through the same redevelopment, uh, to support more democratic models of business. But I get the sectoral thing, but then how would you use delegates or representatives in right. terms of the structure of... Uh, yeah, so, so what would happen, and again, this is basically how it works in Porto Alegre. So you have a sector. You can name it food system, you can name it parks, you can name it transportation. You would have geographically specific, specific delegates from around the city. So in New York, say, the 50 city council, 51 city council districts. And then what they would do is talk about the needs of their districts relative to the needs of the entire city. And what then you would do is prioritize which regions or, or districts, geographic areas in this city are most in need of, of, of items in this sector. So with respect to supermarkets or food distribution or transportation, whatever. Uh, and then proposals would be made to address the needs of the neediest within the geographic area. How would the delegates be selected? Uh, the delegates would be selected by, in the assemblies, which there would be rules about who, who could attend and vote at an assembly. Right now we don't have uh, rules for attending assembly, we have rules for voting for the proposals. So you would have to have deliberations about the criteria for being a delegate to represent your district. How does Porto Library do it? Uh, I don't, there, there you vote on, assemb you, the, the assemblies propose the candidates and the assemblies vote. Um, and so that's how they do it. Uh, and then people can only run generally for one or two terms, so in, in fact, which is sort of general standard in co-ops, so you don't have in cooperative models. Um, I don't know what the voting age is, and I don't in Portugal for that. I assume it's 16. It's usually 16. 
Nanette. Hi, I have a couple of questions <coughs> to each of you. Um, <coughs> um, is there a way, Mike, um, for these different proposals for projects to work cooperatively with each other rather than competitively for different, you know, competing for the same funds? And um, how do you find out, um, let's say, in your district, what participatory democracy budgeting processes are in place? Um, so those are the questions for you. And Ken, I'm just wondering, is it to the members' advantage, and how do they see it, to let their employer know that they belong to this cooperative, or do they view it as something that might lead to their getting fired. <laughs> I could see it cutting both ways, so I'm curious how they understand it. Uh, I would say that um, I, that's a good question. I'm not. I, I I'm not really sure. I don't think it would necessarily play to uh, their disadvantage if um, a parents <coughs> knew that they belonged to the uh, cooperative, um, especially since the Beyond Care. Um, members are going in they're not going to go into a workplace anyway without being paid on the books and uh, they're not going to go into that home without um, having uh, a contract so those are already uh, two major impediments and if you can get over those two hurdles then the fact that you belong to the Beyond Care Cooperative is all the more reason why you're asking for those things to begin with and I wanted to point out a statistic. Um, the, the, this is just fascinating reading. I, I definitely, you know, I have many novels I could recommend to, for you all to read, uh, as you all could recommend them to me. But then there's the Park Slope Parents Nanny Compensation Survey. You really have to check this out, uh, 2013. And uh, one statistic here, uh, 750 respondents, okay, you say, well, statistically, out of 5,000 families that belong to the Park Slope Parents um, group, you know, we can work with that. But of the 750 respondents, um, they say 63%, this is self-reporting, mind you, 63% pay their nannies completely off the books. 10% um, say they pay part on and part off the books. 12% preferred not to answer. <laughs> you have 15% who pay completely on the books. That's it. Okay, here's the other uh, statistic that's very, very, um, of all the st stats here. 49% of the employers in Park Slope have a set of written expectations. 49%. If you're a Beyond Care cooperator and you're going into, you, it's 100% among the Beyond Care cooperators. That's the only way you're going to work at a place. Um, however, that's up from 39% in 2011. So in the last two years, there's been uh, a mar quite a market improvement there. Uh, but it's still less than half percent, and it's still the case that 15 percent, only 15 percent of the families pay completely on the books. So that's a longish answer uh, to provide a little more flesh on the bones, but I would, I would not think, I would speculate that it would not be a problem if you're a parent and you're already going to have a contract and you're already uh, going to be paying fully on the books, if you belong to Beyond Care Cooperative, co uh, cooperative that's fine, that's all the more reason you're asking us to do this to begin with. Yeah, and, just, and Nanette, I'm going to answer both of yours. Um, just a quick comment because I want to say this, and, and Ken was a really great conclusion for what I, what I was presenting too, and that I just want to come back to this notion of empowered participation, um, because a lot of times you think of these things you know, as limited in scope and in scale and so on, but one of the incredible values of it is the sense of empowered participation, and I think that participatory budgeting is only marginally successful in this. Uh, to be honest. Um, in the participatory democracy view that I laid out with Peyton and also my own maximal democracy view, there's this idea of capacity development. So it's not just about having informed citizens making policy. I think it's also about developing capabilities that you think connect to your dignity and protect your se sense of self-worth worth and, and your, your notion of self-development. And that's very strong in Carroll's work. Um, it's not as strong in Peyton's work, actually. Mill was not as he didn't emphasize that as much because we, you know, Mill being the sort of libertarian streak, he didn't want to sort of enforce a kind of commitment to self-development. If you want to be a lazy, you know, good for that, you know, that's your conception of good, that's fine. Um, but participatory democratic theorists are generally have a, a more normative commitment to self-development in many ways around your sense of agency. 
And so what's so important for that is that then these, these local, these small scale experiences become the schoolhouses of, of deep democracy in the sense that you get a feeling for what it takes to, have, to be able to do participation where you're developing solidarity with others, not just doing it isolated as your own entrepreneurial self, but it requires skills to cooperate and skills to, to be uh, effective in terms of solidarity. And that, and so the, being in the worker co-op, and, and it, this, the delegates get this out of participatory budgeting, the ones that have to work with the city agencies, people who just attend assemblies, they don't necessarily get it. And people who vote, they don't necessarily get it. So we have to be able to create more venues for that. Um, to find out more about participatory budgeting in the city, pbnyc.org. pbnyc.org. You can see all the different districts doing it, who your council member is, if they're doing it. Um, in terms of um, the proposals and competition, there it takes, the, the delegates are trained in PB. They also go through a training that's not uh, so unlike the training that, um, well, it's not as extensive as the training that Ken mentioned, but again, any good participatory democracy outfit should have a training component to it. Otherwise, you're probably not taking it seriously, what participation requires. Um, and the delegates are trained, and they're precisely trained to do that kind of thing. There's lots of proposals that can be combined because of where they're located or because they're on the same theme. So they're around the theme of security or they're around the, the theme of, of children's safety or they're around the theme of uh, improving access at the library. So you combine with the uh, improvement of the air conditioning system with wheelchair access with the technology lab at the library. And that depends on the costs. So there's an opportunity to have that kind of coordination of, of seemingly competing proposals when the budget delegates are reviewing them all and talking with the city agencies. Okay, I actually have a question for you, Ken. Oh, okay. Um, if I could. Um, I think that your case is a very important one in that it's always a question for people committed to workplace democracy, how it would apply to uh, service providers, because it's especially those who may be uh, more disparately situated. Most of the classic uh, cases, especially Mondragon and other very successful uh, worker cooperative cases, as well as even the uh, agricultural co-ops around the world. They're mostly on the production mm -hmm. side. Uh, but what is a bit of a question then is, why didn't they decide to, um, to pool their um, income? Was it simply that they were, uh, which does seem to be a, a crucial feature of most of the models out there, was it because they emerged from the situation of sole providers and then I would imagine that was a big factor, you know, where the standard uh, care providers are, you know, just uh, self-employed, and so then they banded together. Or did they actually consider the possibility and reject it, and if so, what were some of the considerations there? Okay, um, I wish I could, I have to go back and ask them. Ah. It, uh, in my interviews and such, I, it just did not, um, it struck me, but I didn't, I didn't pursue that exact point. Uh, and I wish I did, so I could have a good answer for you on this. I, I just don't know. I mean, I guess it would take more of a commitment to egalitarianism as they, to, for them to do that than they have, probably, probably figure they can do better on their own. I don't know. Uh, perhaps, um, uh, perhaps, and they do have a range. Uh, it's not like it's a fixed amount when it comes to, um, you know, uh, uh, one child, two children, more children, you know, um, dual family situations. So there's a range, and maybe, maybe the understanding is that. But even even still, they could still have they an entrepreneurial, yeah. um, semi-entrepreneurial orientation to the parents, and right. take back the goods to the uh, cooperative, right. Right. and then pool it from there. Right. But I'm not sure what the rationale there was. Yes. <clears throat> I can just imagine that parents would be reluctant to give a raise to their their child care worker, knowing that it's not going to go to their the person they know. Well, they to pool go tips and things. So there is a model. Pool tips at restaurants, and that doesn't really discourage us from tipping. Yeah. 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 It's not quite the same, maybe. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not an expert. I, you I, may know I, people here. Must know I'd like to, more I, than I do. I'd like to ask that. I, but I, I wanted to jump well, in uh, just real quick on Mike's point um, and his uh, very gentle, uh, polite disagreement. Um, no, and I, and I appreciate him uh, bringing that up because uh, the issue here is, um, I think what I, when I was describing that part of the issue around subsidizing is I was 
reflecting uh, the conversations I've had with the Center for Family Life, and it's their interest uh, to bring it up to um, parity. That is to say, they don't want to be in a situation where they're subsidizing. And, uh, and you raise a really excellent point. There's all sorts of subsidization out there. How else could you pay minimum wage uh, to Walmart workers or their, you know, uh, there's plenty of subsidization when it comes to the federal government providing uh, goods and services you know, to people who can't afford them on a Walmart wage. So you have that kind of subsidization. So if it works in that kind of environment, why can't it work in the cooperative sector? You know, but, and that's a conversation to take up with the Center for Family Life. Um, and I guess it gets into that big question about scale. You know, uh, under what conditions or under which conditions can the Center for Family Life carry on their work as a co-op incubator if they're really on the hook to be, uh, uh, you know, providing a lifeline to all the cooperate, uh, cooperatives that they've incubated. And so that's a larger question. Um, it's a very good one. I want to take up with the Center for Family Life. Well, if any other kind of uh, co-op incubator. Yeah, but I can give you a real specific example because economic development corporations in New York City and across the United States provide all kinds of subsidies to businesses for Purchase of facilities, workforce development, advertising, marketing. Um, right off the top of my head, those three big. That's so maybe distribution. So why don't co-ops get them? Well, a lot of times co-ops don't get them because they're not knowledgeable. They just assume they're not, you know, we, we enforce our own isolation. Yeah, um, and the other thing, though, is that a lot of people who work at these facilities, in New York, more and more people who are, are familiar with some of these models now, a lot of because of this action in the Bronx, this amazing action in the Bronx right now. Um, but part of this also is, is getting into the master's programs and the, and the programs at CUNY, which actually train uh, or educate a lot of the workforces across New York to put this stuff on the table. And so we're actually working on doing this at Brooklyn College um, so that someone who comes out with a master's of public administration who goes on to work for the city knows what a worker cooperative is. So it's on the radar screen. Oh, yeah, I know this kind of entity. It, it can work, too. There's not that much difference, right? And so then you all of a sudden, it's just, it sometimes can be as simple as that. It's not like, oh, they're conspiring against worker cooperatives. Usually they're not. It's an ignorance thing. They don't know it. There are legal and technical, there are legal barriers sometimes for incorporation. And that's interesting that they never incorporate. They, they're, they're not, they want the NFL model, the National Football League. The National Football League, as I'm sure you all know, as football fans, uh, is a nonprofit. Is a nonprofit. Is a multi billion dollar revenue industry. And its own, it's a nonprofit that pays its head 13 million a year, and the members are the football teams. It's genius, and one of the football teams is a cooperative. Yes, the Green Bay. The Green Bay Packers. Packers. Uh, but anyway, so <laughs> there's some creativity that can happen, and, I, and, I, and it's interesting that they form as a nonprofit. Uh, we'll take one more, and then I have a bright idea about how to handle uh, Kyle, who is still on his way. I'm thinking that we should, uh, after the next uh, question, adjourn to our reception. And then we'll invite him to speak more informally there when he arrives. Uh, because he's definitely going to come, and he's really fascinating. So in any case, that sounds like a nice thing to do. But we'll take one more question. Okay. Oh, you had another one? Okay, two quick questions. questions. I'm, I'm Paula from Olympus of Auto University. I'm sorry, I don't talk very well English, my poor English. It's not my first, nor second, not the first language. <laughs> my first is Portuguese, second is French. First is Spanish and then English. Mm -hmm. But I will try. I understand everything. I speak a little. I will try. My, my question is for both. Uh, in this moment in the world, in, in the European too, uh, everybody talk about uh, participatory democracy, but uh, democracy, democracy is naturally with it's participatory, it's participative. Uh, and uh, I don't understand um, a democracy without participate. Why we talk, uh, in this moment we see uh, the emergency of uh, different communities, communities of knowledge, com communities of action, uh, com communities of work, of economy. But I think the, we need, in this moment, is think a, 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 a other way um, different of democracy. I think democracy is collapse. I think uh, we need to think to create something different, more strong. 
because the terms, the concepts, are always, are always the same. For understanding, I think. I think you, the need is not only to create different communities, is, as you say, uh, as you said, uh, create other, other ways of, of, uh, of thinking. And other ways of thinking is other concepts too. Yeah. Well, uh, sure. Yeah, well, actually, just, uh, just to really pick up real quickly on um, that initial notion, you, you, you know, that that democracy is naturally participatory. So why would we talk about participatory democracy? Yes. And, and, and I have to say, like say in the context here, for me anyway, in the context here in the United States is that democracy has been such a truncated, you know, attenuated, deracinated, that we have to, you know, pump it up with, uh, you know, some content. And, um, and, and so much of democracy, so much of the discourse of democracy here is uh, purely in terms, uh, it's just political. We, we, we have such a difficult time thinking in terms of political economy. And so, and even in political democracy, it's highly truncated, but, in, and certainly economic falls out of the picture altogether. And so that's, um, I think it's this context, the rhetorical context in which we uh, inhabit that is it's so um, dried up and withered. And that's how this yeah. comes about. Just real quick on that. I mean, yeah, part is the misapplication of the term. So we re live in a representative oligarchy, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there are representation for particular groups, and then there's a concentration of power, and then they decide what to do. So, you know, that would be the, probably the most accurate, and I say that completely objectively. I mean, that's probably the most, most accurate characterization of the particular political system that we're in. And there's a lot of so-called democracies that are actually semi-representative oligarchies. Um, the other thing is, you know, the whole question of, well, participatory democracy is appropriate for some, I read, some sectors and not for others. You know, so you have these kinds of debates. I mean, obviously what we really want is participatory democracy in terms of ownership, right? I mean, it's not just in terms of policy debates, it's in terms of who has the assets and control and access to the assets. So it's as much about pushing that participatory democracy framework into the, into the, the, the terrain of ownership, and that's worker co-ops are one in a way, devious way of getting at the ownership question. It's not just about workers feeling more empowered, it's about de-concentrating wealth. It's a strategy for doing that, as well as creating the experience of solidarity and cooperation. Uh, yes, and uh, was it on right on this topic? It's just, yeah, I yeah. Yeah. Okay. Then, It's actually also a question for both of you, and following up a little bit on the previous one. Um, you, you said that it would be interesting to see if the BM care um, case could be an example of participatory democracy as you proposed. But I was wondering uh, from the, the quotation from the president that you mentioned, and she said, if I remember, so beyond care it's democracy, uh, solidarity and professionalism, and democracy we can see that it's democracy because we vote to elect uh, representatives. So she seemed to have an idea of democracy that was electoral democracy or representative democracy. So I was wondering in, on what terms then it could be an, an example of participatory democracy and not simply what she seemed to imagine as representative democracy. So is it because there is also this whole empowerment thing or is it because it's it belongs to the economical realm as a or work realm as opposed to uh, public policy programs so what terms okay um, well if I understand correctly I mean the way I'm reading this is that you know it's profoundly participatory um, because of the concentration and intensity of the meetings that they have in which you know they're they were first um, meeting every other week uh, to get it going, and now they're on a monthly basis, and there are other committees that are meeting on a monthly basis and such, and they're all meeting together, uh, not just some of them, but all 34 of them. Now, of course, if it were if it were 134, then this would be it would be a different discussion. But it's 34 right now, and they're and when they meet, they have childcare themselves that people come in. But I think it's in the context of those meetings. Yes, there is a leadership committee, but they're accountable to those monthly meetings. But they don't share revenue, right? I mean, they pay; they each pay the 50 bucks, but as we were saying earlier, Carol was saying, they don't pool. So pooling would be an example of 
-hmm. participatory democracy with respect to the assets and the ownership of the pro or the control over profits. Sure. So sure. they don't have that. So in that sense, they're less participatory democratic on the model. But the but, but the range of but the range between the lowest and the highest amount in any given um, child care situation is, is not huge. Right. It's not like oh, it could be ten in one family and right. twenty five in another. It's more like fourteen versus sixteen. So that range is very... So they're egalitarian and that's more very, egalitarian. It's very, yeah. you know, narrow. Okay, let's hear you had a question. Uh, yes, uh, uh, full of questions, but uh, I just wanted to throw in this idea. It's an uh, idea of a friend of mine who teaches philosophy at the uh, University of Illinois Chicago, UIC, Paul Gomberg, not a household name. Uh, the idea is in a book about equality, uh, based on really racism and equality, his idea is called contributive justice. And what struck me about it was that it might be, I would love to hear people, you two now, but in general, in the course of a uh, conference, think about this. Uh, it's the idea that one contributes more and more complex labor in a society that is an egalitarian, for him, for Paul, communist society, egalitarian communist society. Uh, so definitely post-capitalist, definitely not based on the profit model. What would that look like? And this idea of capacity development, which is the NGO term, is, that's how I'm familiar with it anyway, maybe for example. Uh, if you think of capacity development as what one contributes to the production of social life, yeah. and the ability of uh, the need for forms of organization where people can contribute more and more yeah. complex forms of labor, yeah. then these things are what they are called schools of communism. I mean, you yeah. can learn there, uh, and of course, the, the particular, Beauty, I think, uh, beyond care is the kind of workers that are involved there. Okay, workers who are not used to thinking of themselves as contributing complex labor. So that's an interesting idea. I just wanted to throw it into the conference and see what we well, and they invite it too, insofar as that training program. They're they're not going in and say, okay, well, what can we do to you know just get through the day, but they're already you know participating in uh, this eight week training with a whole list of skills and talents that they bring to bear. And what they're also doing is holding back from the kinds of other labor that they might be expected to do. Oh, mm -hmm. thanks for doing the um, cleaning up after the children, but hey, could you hit the uh, bedroom? Could you hit the bathroom? Could you take care of this and that? And they're like, no, we're not going to do that. But what we will do is this kind of education for your children, this type of... Oh, so they're holding out against some forms of labor so that they can enhance other forms of labor. Right. Yeah, uh, my social reproduction, a lot of times it's going to be called or characterized as, in other words, there's labor that's, count, that's categorized as productive, that's, you know, we have a good understanding of commodification and so on and payment, and there's a, a, a lot of other kinds of labor that it, maybe they're, they're more difficult to measure in terms of their value, whether it's care work, um, it's immaterial labor, you know, and so on and so on. And so I think there's a lot of different folks working on that. There are a couple conference presentations. I know there's one tomorrow with Kenneth Edusing and Kenton Card um, on the um, conception of the commons, mm -hmm. uh, which also connects to this, right? And these different kinds of activities that we don't necessarily think of as labor. And of course, the problem with it is it's a lot of it is women's work. Yeah, absolutely. And the fe yeah, feminists have been So there have been a the lot best. of uh, good theory about, uh, you know, counting. Yeah, yeah. Racially segmented work. Yes. Yes. Ladies so, segmentation. Yep. Right. Um, I would propose then that we, um, before we move, I want to say where we're going to go, and then we should thank our speakers. Uh, we have a very nice reception in 5109 on the fifth floor, where you can have some wine and some treats, which will restore you. If our speaker uh, comes by, as I hope he will, we will have an opportunity for some form of informal presentation. There's a table and a seminar style down there. So first we'll eat and drink and then hopefully a little more engagement. Please join me in thanking uh, Mike and Ken for their very <laughs>